to demonstrate the impact that missionaries had in terms of um, fighting forced labor, I, I look at French and British, I mean, uh, uh, French and Belgian Congo, which are in uh, Central Africa. Um, at the beginning part of the 20th century, you get a massive increase in the price of rubber. They learn how to vulcanize rubber, and then they're using rubber for bicycles and uh, hoses and cars and other things like that as they come online. So the price of rubber goes up very, very steeply. It takes a long time to plant rubber trees and, and ha be able to harvest them. So they begin to um, try and harvest wild rubber from the jungle in um, the Congo Basin. Um, both the Belgians and the French set up monopoly trade companies who used forced labor not only to make people move uh, goods, but also to collect rubber. So various villages were um, uh, uh, imposed quotas of rubber that they had to produce each year. If they didn't produce the uh, required rubber, they would send in proxy armies that would burn down the village and burn down their crops and try and kill as many people as they could. Um, this was done at a distance and sort of over to sort of monitor the, the armies to make sure that they were doing what they're doing. Sometimes they would have them collect either the hands or the penises of, of people that they killed to demonstrate that they had killed them. Um, sometimes the soldiers, in order to save bullets, which were valuable for other things, would just um, dismember people who were alive. Um, and so uh, you have both through killing, but mostly through disease and starvation by people fleeing into the, into the jungle, you have close to 50% population decline in 20 years in Belgian and French Congo. So a terrible, atrocious situation. Um, in the Belgian Congo, where you had Protestant missionaries who were there, um, they photographed uh, these incidents and smuggled them out, and also smuggled out letters, and they would go around uh, Europe and North America showing uh, magic lantern shows of, of these atrocities and mobilizing su support against it. And you get the largest movement um, since abolitionism, international movement, um, which forced the Belgian Congo to take over um, uh, the Belgian uh, Congo from King Leopold and oppose some at least basic reforms, although they continue to use forced labor until World War II. Um, in French Congo, you get absolutely nothing. You get no protest whatsoever, except for one article in a Marxist newspaper in um, France, but no social movement. This is exactly the same things are happening exactly at the same time. And I basically show you, are, you had Protestant missionaries in the Belgian Congo. You didn't have Protestant missionaries in the French Congo. And that's the difference in terms of what gets exposed or not. Um, so it, some of the pictures are really awful. I mean, if you see them, they, they, they still make me um, mad. Because they're really, they're, I mean, you cannot look at them and not be horrified at some of the things that human beings did to other people. Um, but they had the same effect then as they, did, they have now. Um, missionaries were also crucial to the spread of civil society. Um, they organized new, developed new, two, new types of organizations in order to spread missions, but those were also used then for abolitionism and temperance. Um, and you can see the crucial link in terms of these nonconformist religious organizations, um, in terms of where you get the spread of voluntary organizations. Um, uh, earliest in places like England, the US, and, and Calcutta, India, at uh, roughly the same times, um, earlier than other places in Eastern, uh, East Asia or in or, uh, continental Europe, uh, which had quite high levels of development. Um, just for time, I won't go into all the details of that, but you can ask me if you'd like. Um, and then, then they were crucial to spreading them around the world. So wherever Protestant missionaries went, they fought what they considered abuses in local society. So um, foot binding, child marriage, uh, uh, sati, various things like that. So um, sati was when a, a, a male Hindu died. Um, the wife was supposed to burn herself alive on his funeral pyre, which missionaries thought was bad. So um, they organized a, uh, a, petition, a campaign to try and ban it, uh, which was popular by some people and very unpopular by others. Um, but they used, they introduced these camp uh, techniques of like petitions and uh, uh, like newspapers and traveling speakers and weekly meetings and other things like that where they're trying to organize uh, opposition to sati. Um, some people copy them uh, to fight for, against sati and some of the people copy them to fight against sati. So Ramahan Roy, who was someone who helped them translate the Bible into Bengali, um, formed Brahma Samaj to fight sati, but he also at that point doesn't want people to convert to Protestantism. Um, other people like form Kalagata Sarma Sabha to keep sati, but they're using the same organizational tactics, which then, and you can show this all around the world in terms of how you get the spread of these various forms of organization. 
um, around the world, uh, which scholars like Anheyer and Salman say there was no precedence for, precedent for internationally. And Estelle James says, a similar institutional form may not exist in economies that do not have a colonial missionary background. So they were crucial in terms of spreading this organizational form.